Welcome to part two of what a Trump presidency will mean for America and the Christian church. Part two, I'm going to try to uh, get to King Josiah and Israel. I covered that a little bit in part one. But before I do, I want to cover some more background stuff. From what I understand, Donald Trump, an outsider to the political process, uh, from what I've been shown so far, he is filling in his cabinet with a bunch of political insiders. You know, people have been in politics all their lives. Um, now, let me explain something to you. Usually what happens is, when a politician gets elected, they will make, you know, before they get elected, they make a bunch of campaign promises. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then when they get elected, they say, well, you know, I wanted to do this, but the, um, if, for example, if they're a Republican, they'll say, well, I, you know, I wanted to do this, but the Democrats in Congress, they stopped us. But if it's a Democratic president, they'll say, well, you know, I tried to do this, but the Republicans in Congress, they stopped us. Um, case in point, when Ronald Reagan was president and George Bush was vice president, you know, that guy that was uh, head of the CIA, it was a democratically controlled Congress that took a bill. Now, I was a business major in college. And what it was, for example, let's say you worked for a company, let's say Pan American Airlines, Pan Am. They'd been in business over 50 years. Uh, TWA, they'd been in business for over 50 years. And uh, if you look at old movies, you'll see the planes, you know. So what happens was you worked for a company like that for over 50 years. I mean, you know. Let's say you worked for them for 30 years and you got a pension, right? Well, democratically controlled Congress passed a law. And it used to be that if you worked for a company, the pension money that the company put into your account, into a separate bank account, the company couldn't touch the money. It, it, it was in a separate account. The company couldn't touch it. It belonged to you. And then when you retired, you got the money. Well, a democratically controlled Congress changed the law and said, well, you know, it's the company's money. They should be able to borrow against it. Okay, fine, right? So what happened was, remember now, democratically controlled Congress passed this law. Ronald Reagan, a Republican, was president. Well, so the democratically controlled Congress took took the law, said that companies can borrow against the pension fund money, and they put the bill on Reagan's desk. So the Democrats put this bill on the Republicans' desk. Reagan signed it into law. What do the democratically controlled newspapers say? Oh, that terrible, horrible Republican president signed the law that the, the companies can take people's pensions now. You know, it's a game. You know, so what happened? Uh, people like, if our memory serves me correctly, like Michael Milken and T. Boone Pickens, what they did was is they bought these companies up. And then they borrowed the money of the pension funds and put an IOU in there, okay? And what they did was is they stripped the company of all the assets, so basically, if you were Pan Am or TWA, they sold off the valuable airline routes that the FAA government had awarded them to other airlines for, you know, money. And then they sold all the planes, sold the computers, sold the office equipment, sold everything, basically. So TWA and Pan Am basically were nothing anymore. I mean, the planes were gone. The business is gone. All it is is a name. Well, there was an IOU in the pension funds. 
but the company's not worth anything. So they just declare bankruptcy and the people basically lost their pensions. So you work for 30 years and you get nothing for the company. You work 30 years for the company and you get nothing. And the Democrats point their fingers at the Republicans and the Republicans point their fingers at the Democrats and say, oh, it's their fault. No, it's their fault. It's their fault. No, it's their fault. Meanwhile, the Americans get who worked get nothing. And then the Democrats get up and have the nerve to say, yeah, we're for the little guy. We're for the working man. It's those evil Republicans that are for big business. So Michael Milken um, did this. He stole, I think, a billion dollars worth of pensions or whatever, and he got caught doing something. And he stole a billion dollars. For those of you that don't know it, that's a thousand millions. And he gave a half a half that money, half a billion, five hundred million dollars to the Israeli state. And he got an award, you know. Oh, he's so wonderful. He's helping Israel. But uh, he got caught doing something, and he went to jail for 18 months, if you call it a jail. You know, he went to one of those club-fed jails. You know, no walls, no no barbed wire. It's on an Air Force base. You know, golf course, tennis courts, swimming pool, bowling alley, movie theater. Your wife can come and stay with you, you know. And he was complaining because, after all, do you know how expensive it is to fly in kosher food? Um for your chef to, you know, make your meals. I mean, I, I feel so bad for him. I mean, you know, FedEx is really expensive, flying in your kosher food, you know, via FedEx. I felt so bad for him, you know. I mean, he might have spent a million dollars on his meals, you know, in the 18 months that he went to, to uh, you know, that, that golf course, you know, playing golf and tennis every day in the swimming pool. Um, what can I tell you? So he spent 18 months in a, a thing. And it's on an Air Force base. One of my buddies I worked with was telling me that there's, you know, there was no walls, no no nothing. You just walk off the Air Force base. But the only problem is when you try to get back on the Air Force base. You know, that's when you have a problem. But, hey, no big deal. You know, you walk out of prison and, um, and, and then you just tell the guys, well, you know, I... I ran away, but I'm turning myself back in, you know. So, you know, that's how that works. Uh, president Nixon. I wasn't old enough to vote. I was in the Army when Nixon was president, and he did Watergate. He was trying to spy on the Democrats. He knew that they were a bunch of lying thieves. And I guess he was trying to clean things up a little bit, from what I understand. But... Um, they caught him spying and they disgraced him and, you know, they, uh, I think he got impeached or whatever and he stepped down. And then they put a guy in, Gerald Ford, became president. And the thing was, nobody voted for Gerald Ford. Nobody. I mean, I, I think the president, Nixon, and the vice president, I think it was Spiro Agnew, they both stepped down. Well, Gerald Ford was appointed president. Nobody had ever voted for him. And he was on the Warren Commission that I had mentioned that uh, when Kennedy got caught, there was a whole bunch of discrepancies um, about the, um, you know, how did Oswald supposedly fire three shots and this and that and the other. And I mentioned that in the other uh, part one of the Trump presidency thing. So Ford... Nobody ever voted for him. He became president. He was on the Warren Commission. So he covered up Kennedy's assassination, if anything. So we voted, I voted for President Carter, Jimmy Carter. He was a peanut farmer from Georgia, and he was an Air Force officer on an, in the Navy. I'm sorry, not Air Force. A naval officer on a nuclear uh, submarine. You know, guy's not an idiot. I mean, he went to college, you know. But what did he do? Oh, well, I'm a political insider. I mean, outsider. I'm not a politician. Well, what did he do? Filled his cabinet full 
of Washington insiders. I mean, just, just like what Trump is supposedly doing right now. And just everything he did was against the American people. He didn't keep any of his promises, campaign promises, just like all the other politicians. So what can I tell you? And then uh, Reagan became president, you know, the one that signed the... Um, the bill that gave that the Democrats put on its desk that they could strip the pension funds. You know, it wasn't just TWA and, and Pan Am that did this. I mean, it was a lot of companies went out of business and people lost their pensions. Really horrible. I mean, you know, now um, all they got to do now to strip you of your pension, whether you work for a city, a county, uh, a business, is just go before a bankruptcy judge. And then they sign off on it, and you don't have a pension. And it used to be in the 50s, they couldn't do that. Absolutely could not do that. So, like I say, the Republicans point their fingers at the Democrats. It's their fault. The Democrats point their fingers at the Republicans. It's their fault. Little guy gets screwed as normal. Um, that's not theological language, but, you know, you get the point. And... Um, you know, that's how they play the game. And by the way, uh, during the Watergate investigation against Nixon, when he uh, supposedly broke into the Watergate Hotel to spy on the Democrats, there was a woman there who was a lawyer who became, who got fired by the other Democrats. She was a lawyer, special counsel, and her name was Hillary Clinton. And when asked why they fired her, they said, well, she's unethical and she's a liar. Seems like things haven't changed, have they? So, you know, and that's how things work, basically. You know, I imagine Trump will not keep any of his promises and then say, well, you know, the Democrats stopped us. We don't have the, uh, we can't do this. Uh, for example, NAFTA. George Bush started NAFTA, and Clinton, of course, Bill, he said he was against it. And then when he became president, everything. Um, guess who voted and, and the tie-breaking vote? His vice president, Al Gore. You know, he passed. It passed by one vote. But the thing was, is if, it was 50% plus one vote that passed it. Well, that was illegal because it was a treaty between company, countries. And a treaty had to be passed by two-thirds vote. But what they did was, oh, it's not a treaty, it's an agreement. So they, it was 50% plus one vote. So, you know, the Democrats said, oh, oh, it's those terrible Republicans. They want to ship all our jobs overseas, all our companies. You know, they're trying to help big business. Oh, I'm big. I'm Bubba, Bill Clinton, Bubba, and I'm against that. Well, guess what? It passed under Clinton. His vice president passed, you know, the deciding vote, the, uh, the agreement, 50% plus one. And then the Republicans blamed the Democrats, and the Democrats blamed the Republicans. And... Uh, Will it happen again? I don't know. All right, so let's uh, take a look at some other things. And, oh, take a look at, uh, you know, when um, Bush was in office, right? Um, after 9-11, you know, well, we're going to go attack those terrorists. And, of course, his family's been in the war munitions industry since before World War I. The Bush family, oh yeah, you know, head of the CIA, and, you know, we go to Afghanistan, and, you know, Afghanistan's got lithium, and you know, if you ever bought those lithium batteries, you know, all the, um, your cell phones have got lithium batteries, um, they're lightweight, they're more powerful than the old batteries, and, uh, you know, the electric cars, they all use lithium batteries, and of course, uh, Afghanistan's got um, oil and it's got gas. Matter of fact, we put um, President Karzai, K E R Z Z A I, in as president of Afghanistan after we overthrew the Taliban. Well, guess what? He worked for Union Oil, California. 
he was in he was over here working we sent him over there right and of course um, you know we attack Iraq for weapons of mass destruction well who do you think sold them the poison gas that they used for the Iranians against the Iranians when they were fighting Iran we did we sold them the uh, poison gas of course that's how we knew they had weapons of mass destruction we sold it to them. But of course, you know, um, Obama says, well, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna pull the troops out of Afghanistan and Iraq. We're gonna bring them home. Eight years later, they're still there. You know, when Bush signed the Patriot Act, guess what? All the Democrats pointed and said, that's horrible. That suspends the Constitution. That, that gets rid of all the people's civil liberties. That's terrible. We hate the Patriot Act. It's against the American people. It's, it's un-American. Well, guess what? When the Patriot Act expired and Bush, the Republicans, signed it you know, into law, the Democrats were against it. Well, guess what? When it came up for renewal since it was expiring and Obama re-signed it, re-enacted it, kept it in law, well, Republicans bad, Democrats good. All of a sudden, the Democrats supported the Patriot Act. So when a Republican signs the bill, it's bad. When a Democrat signs the same bill, it's good. Good Republican, I mean, I'm sorry, bad Republicans, good Democrats. That's how it works. So what'll, what'll a, a, a Trump presidency mean? Well, if it's all political insiders that get appointed to all those cabinet positions, what's going to change? Probably nothing. So, what can I tell you? All right, let's take a look at King Josiah. This is what um, America really could use. Israel had a, a King Josiah. Well, I'd covered in the previous study, Israel had split from Judah. And Israel went into apostasy. And then Judah started to go into apostasy. And it's always the top. How does this work? Well, it's always the leaders. Let's face it. In Jesus' day, it was the Jewish leaders, the rabbis, the chief priests, and what have you, that were leading the people astray. I mean, that's, you know, they were the ones that took Jesus from the garden and they gave him a trial and then they delivered him to, um, to Pilate. And I just did a study on who killed Jesus, a recent study. And it clearly was not Pilate. Pilate tried to release him three times. I mean, come on. Let's face it. Pilate wanted nothing to do with, with Jesus. He knew for envy that the uh, Jews had delivered him because he had blasted them for their hypocrisy. So, you know, they had convicted him to death, delivered him to Pilate. Pilate wanted nothing to do with it. So what did they do? They accused Pilate of treason against Rome if they didn't if he didn't execute Christ who cl they said claimed to be a king against Caesar well that's what it is it's always the leaders it's always the wickedness always comes from the top and goes down all right let's take a look in Psalms chapter 7 and verse 11, we read, God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. God is angry with the wicked every day. In Psalms 9 and chapter 17, we read, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Has America forgotten God? 
Well, let's see. Abortion's legal. Sodomite marriages. Everything that God hates, America loves. And everything that America loves, God hates, right? So everything that God loves, America hates. And everything that God hates, America loves. Period. Here's something evil. Psalms 37 and verse 14. I think about this every time I, I read this. I think about politics, right? Nothing's changed. Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun. Psalms 37, 14. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow, you know, bow and arrow, to cast down the poor and the needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. And then in uh, Psalms 37, 16, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. You see, the um, when politicians get into office, they end up, you know, being worth a lot more money after they get out than what they were worth when they went in. And, you know, let's face it, uh, Bloomberg, he was mayor of New York, you know, a nice Jewish boy. He spent over $50 million of his own money to get elected to an office that paid, what, a quarter million dollars a year? Um, you're going to spend $50 to make a quarter, 25 cents? That's not very good business sense. But when you realize that he was able to hand out government contracts to all his business associates, well, maybe it does make sense, right? Why would you spend $50 million of your own money to make 250000 doesn't make economic sense. What can I tell you? Here's an interesting Bible verse in the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 6. But ye have despised the poor. Now, this is the church. But ye have despised the poor. Oh, of course you despise the poor. They can't throw money in that collection plate and tithe. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you? Oh, yeah, rich men, they oppress you. And draw you before the judgment seats? Yeah, they take you to court, right? Verse 7. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by the which ye are called? Oh, yeah. And what's that worthy name? It's not Yeshua. It's Christians. Yeah, rich people oppress the Christians. I mean, that's in the Bible. The book of James. We just read it, right? Here's an interesting verse. Proverbs 16, verse 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Did you know God made the wicked for the day of evil? That's the day of judgment. The, when he talks about the day of evil, he's talking about the day of evil is going to be for those that are wicked and evil, for the those that hate God. But for the righteous, well, it's a day of salvation. Let's face it, the flood. Was that a day of salvation or a day of evil? If you were one of the wicked, it was a day of evil. If you were Noah and his family, it was a day of salvation. The flood saved Noah's family. That's what the Bible says. Oh, yeah. In Proverbs 17 and verse 23, it says, A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. And when we call that today, we call that a bribe. So a wicked man takes a bribe out of the, you know, the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. 
a judge. You know, he takes a bribe from a rich person to pervert, you know, to steal what little um, a poor person has. Proverbs 28, verse 12. When righteous men do rejoice, there is great glory. But when the wicked rise, a man is hidden. Verse 15. As a roaring lion and a raging bear, so is a wicked ruler over the poor people. Verse 28, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. And this is the verse I was really looking for. Proverbs 29, verse 2. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. So right now the people are mourning. Oh, let's see. Proverbs twenty nine verse twelve. If a ruling if a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. Sounds like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? All right, one more. Proverbs 29, verse 27. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, but he that is upright in the way is abomination to the wicked. You get a real Christian that is honest and trustworthy, those people, we're, those people are an abomination to the wicked. I mean, it's these words were written probably 3,500 years ago and are just as true today as they were back then. But rest assured, one day the wicked will be destroyed. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1, for behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Stubble is something you start a fire with, right? And the day cometh that and and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Huh. So, it's not going to leave them, neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes, ashes, under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And remember, it, Peter, Peter talks about uh, the heaven and, heavens and the earth would melt with fervent heat. Oh yeah, it's coming, people. It's coming. So let's take a look. Now, please understand something. America, originally, many, many of their laws were based upon the Bible. For example, if an animal got loose and injured a neighbor, the farmer that had the animal was responsible for taking care of the neighbor that got hurt. And... They call that tort, T-O-R-T. And that's basically, you know, if you're in an auto accident and, you know, that's why uh, we have insurance. You know, if somebody rams into you and disables you, you get paid. Um, of course, it's been perverted. You know, the lawyers take, you're crippled and the lawyers take half. The lawyers and the doctors take over half. And then you're left with 
whatever's left over, you know, and you're disabled for the rest of your life. But all those things came from the Bible. Um, on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, it says, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land. That's a quote right out of the Bible. Right out of the Bible. Yeah, that's in uh, Leviticus 25 and verse 10. It's talking about the Jubilee. And all the Hebrew roots people love to talk about the Jubilee. Well, you know what? If we had our true Jubilee, everybody's mortgage on their house would be canceled and the banks would go crazy. You know, you got a 30-year mortgage. Well, on the 50th year, um, the, you know, just because you got a 30-year mortgage doesn't mean you got to wait 50 years. No, no, no. Every 50 years was our ju what they called the Jubilee. So if you had a 30-year mortgage and it was like five years till the Jubilee, the house was yours. You wouldn't, you wouldn't pay the 30-year mortgage. You'd pay five years, Jubilee year, you, the house is yours. Uh, it's funny, the uh, Hebrew roots deceivers never mention this fact. All your credit card debt, canceled. Your car payments, canceled. Your mortgage on your house, canceled. All right, so Leviticus 25, verse 10. And ye shall hollow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the ha inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, let's see. In Isaiah 61 and verse 1, this is something Jesus read in the temple when he started his ministry. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He shall set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And it's talking about the uh, prison in hell, right? Uh, Jesus even went to uh, Abraham's bosom. I did a study on that uh, for three days and three nights. You know, all the Old Testament saints went to a compartment in hell. Did you know that? Jesus went there to preach to them. It's a, uh, it's a very interesting study. I, I find it fascinating. But then again, I'm weird. You know, I don't sit around and watch Pawn Stars and... Uh, Lady Gag, Gag A, oh, I mean uh, Gaga and uh, Britney Spears and Madonna and all the rest of those, whatever. And Kim Kardashian, I wonder what she's been up to. Jeremiah 34 and verse 8. This is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord after that the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. You know, a lot of people don't know it, but Harvard and Yale, Princeton, you know, the Ivy League schools, they were all started as Bible colleges. Did you know that? I uh, did a wedding for a guy that I think he went to Harvard or Yale. I forget which one. I think it was Harvard. He was a lawyer, right? And I mentioned all this to him, and he's like, really? I didn't know that. And I was like, uh, yeah, Harvard was originally started as a Bible college. And guess what they taught in the law school? The Bible, the book of Leviticus. He didn't even know it. This is how far America has fallen. You know, it's just, it's terrible. So, oh, it's, it's something. All right, so let's, um, I'm, I'm going to make this a part two. And then we're going to do, part three is going to be King Josiah. America doesn't need necessarily a Donald Trump. We need a King Josiah, a good king. He was one of the, I think he was the last good king of Judah before they went into the Babylonian captivity, which you can read about in the book of Daniel. So, 
All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. End of part two. Look for part three, King Josiah.